Hello, and welcome to the eTech Podcast with me, your host, Ryan Morn. I have been involved in the development of electrified vehicles and machines since 2005 as an engineer and a business leader. This podcast is the product of my passion for electric and autonomous vehicle technology. I'm here to share knowledge from some of the world's leading experts, as well as my own insights. Join me as we accelerate the transition to cleaner, safer and smarter vehicles and grow the industry around the world. Uh, Today we're going to talk about something that's a really small part, but very important part of every EV driveline. And it's something that's a major part of our business here at Avid. Uh, We're going to talk about pumps, and in particular, um, coolant pumps. Um, So coolant pumps are required uh, for cooling, basically, to pump coolant around the EV driveline. Even in a very efficient electric vehicle powertrain, there's still cooling requirements uh, for the motors, the power electronics, cooling and heating the battery system, and of course, providing uh, heating and cooling for the occupants. And typically what we do is we circulate a water glycol mix around the vehicle and the vehicle cooling system. And to do that, we need uh, we need a pump. And in an electric vehicle, whilst the, the thermal management, the heat rejection loads are much greatly reduced compared to an internal combustion engine because of the very high efficiency of the electric drivetrain components. Uh, so in an, in an ICE engine powertrain, you might have 50% or more of the power being generated uh, is going to waste as heat. So you've got a really big thermal management challenge in an internal combustion engine vehicle. Uh, So hot exhaust systems, very hot cooling systems, a lot of heat rejection through the radiator and the cooling system. So on an EV, you don't have anywhere near the level of heat to deal with, but um, it is still a complicated challenge. So an EV is, is much, much, much more efficient than an ICE vehicle. So maybe like... Uh, 90% efficient in the driveline, but uh, th- there's some specific challenges there in terms of the, the relatively low temperature that the EV components have to operate at. And you've got some very, very big heat fluxes um, in the key com- key items such as power inverters, DC-DC converters and onboard chargers due to the switching devices. And what that means is the, the heat sink design in these des- devices has to be very carefully considered and we need relatively high coolant flows being directed through relatively small uh, heat transfer surface areas, so basically small pipe work on the vehicle. So the pump and the coolant system is a very important part of the EV, and getting the pump design right is a key part of the EV driveline. And there's also key development in terms of electrified coolant pumps in internal combustion engine vehicles as well. So in an ICE engine, there's been a trend towards electrifying the main engine coolant pump for a number of years now. Um, So traditionally, it was driven on the front end of the engine by a belt, but then it's been electrified. So first seen about 10 years ago by BMW with their efficient dynamics package, uh, which I was a big fan of, uh, but now widely adopted across the industry. So electric main engine coolant pumps help you to optimize the engine warm-up time and keep the engine running at a much more consistent temperature. So there's basically there's a lot of applications for electric cooling pumps, both in electric vehicles and also in more conventional vehicles. Coolant pumps are typically a style of pump called a centrifugal pump. So in a centrifugal pump, you have an impeller that is spinning, and the impeller is spinning uh, in such a way that it draws coolant in through the center of the impeller and then it's flung out of the impeller by centrifugal forces, hence the name. Uh, So it moves radially out through the impeller, and then it's captured by uh, something called a volute, which is in the the head of the pump. And the volute then basically channels the coolant to the pump outlet. So um, so that's that's how the coolant progresses through the pump. So it's it's not uh, what you would call a positive displacement pump, it is a, it's a kinetic pump or where you're in putting kinetic energy in. So there's some um, there's basically some disadvantages about that kind of pump to do with its efficiency levels. But it's really it's the favoured kind of pump for coolant because it's it's basically tolerant to deadheading and wide pressure variations. As the um, 
the cooling requirements go up and down in the vehicle powertrain and the pressure requirements go up and down, that makes that would make life virtually impossible for a positive displacement uh, pump to, to function correctly. You could only use a positive displacement pump if you had very, very tight control um, over the, the cooling system, which you, know, you might have in a motorsport application. So in some racing applications, they use positive displacement pumps for the coolant. But in a normal sort of passenger car application, there's too many variables. Uh, so they don't work. So the ten, we, we, we sacrifice a little bit of efficiency uh, with the centrifugal pump, but we get a much more flexible overall kind of uh, pump arrangement. So in an electric coolant pump, the impeller is driven by a motor. Uh, so typically, these are high efficiency brushless DC motors, uh, sometimes known as EC motors. And if you've ever seen that EC, what that stands for is electronically commutated. So in the old days, a conventional brushed DC motor had a thing called a mechanical commutator. So the brushes ran across a split copper ring, uh, which basically alternated the power to windings inside the rotor. On a, on a brushless DC motor, you, you don't have the brushes and the commutation mechanical commutation ring. Uh, you do electronic commutation with an electronic motor controller. Uh, so a brushless DC motor, you always need an electronic uh, motor controller for that. Um, and that's what drives the pump. So in between the cavity where the coolant is and the electrical cavity where the motor is, uh, you know, you, there's a couple of different arrangements there in terms of how you would design the pump uh, for a sealing arrangement. Uh, so the, the first and most basic is a face seal, uh, which keeps fluid out of the motor. And then the other arrangement is a sealless pump, so basically where there's no seal. So firstly, if we talk about sealed pumps, so this is the classic design for an automotive coolant pump. So basically every uh, mechanical pump in a passenger car, so millions and millions and millions of these worldwide, uses a face seal um, or, or um, a sprung lip seal, um, but basically sealed pumps, so a shaft passes from the motor or from the pulley drive in the case of a mechanical pump but from the motor through a seal and then you've got the wet side of the pump where the impeller is running and the seal keeps the coolant away from the motor uh, the seal faces are continuously in contact you need some pressure there and they typically require a small amount of coolant to pass between the faces and that acts as a lubricant um, and also as a coolant for the seal faces uh, so despite using some self-lubricating materials and very resistant materials um, these running faces are subject to wear. If you run them without coolant, they get hot. Uh, that'll really accelerate the wear and cause the seal to overheat and wear out or burn out completely. And I've literally seen seals, coolant pump seals, are completely melted because they've, they've overheated uh, in the absence of coolant. Um, debris in the coolant can become embedded in the seal. Um, but in, in general, basically, the seal is a wearing component. It will always wear out. Um, many improvements have been made to uh, coolant seals, but you know, still essentially they have a lifespan. Um, and in passenger car, this can be okay, the lifespan. But in a lot of truck uh, applications, you know, it's it's now a service component. So you, if you've got a face seal in a coolant pump, you're going to have to change that multiple times in the life of the vehicle. <clears throat> um, in an electric or hybrid vehicle. Um, because in, in the low temperature cooling system, um, we've got uh, a low low temperature, low pressure coolant moving through the system. Basically, there's a bit of an issue. The small quantity of fluid that leaks past the seal can become problematic because in an internal combustion engine, this fluid is very hot uh, and under pressure. So when it leaks across the seal, it immediately evaporates. So you never see it. Uh, you might see some little traces of uh, evaporation around the coolant pump, but you tend to have a way of dealing with it. Uh, the coolant goes past the seal, it evaporates, it's, it's not a problem. But in a low temperature cooling system like you'd have on an electric or hybrid vehicle, um, it basically the, the coolant doesn't evaporate. So you can end up with uh, needing to deal with small amounts of coolant that are getting past the seal. And it's often misdiagnosed as a fault with the coolant pump. And actually, there's nothing wrong with the seal. Typically, it's just the normal expected leak by that you would get um, in the pump. So, you know, it, it's, that's a pretty significant disadvantage. But there are many, many advantages to the sealed coolant pump. It's very established technology. These things have been around for like literally maybe 100 years. Um, the, 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 what it means in an electric pump with a seal is you can run a really efficient motor. So you can have a very tight air gap. Um, in the motor, um, you don't have to worry about debris getting into the motor, particularly with a brushless DC motor, which has got magnets in the rotor. If the debris is ferrous, it can 
jam up the motor and that can be a really uh, that can be a really big big problem so you know that's the typical sealed pump then if we're talking about sealless coolant pumps there are two different styles of sealless coolant pumps so you've got the probably like the what i say the generation one sealless coolant pump the, which is magnetically coupled so in that style of pump you have the motor and then you've got a magnetic coupling and then uh, basically a, a sealed cavity with the impeller running inside it so there's no shaft passing between the motor rotor and the pump impeller it's all done through a magnetic uh, coupling and if you ever looked at a pump in a central heating system in your house or domestic heating system there's a kind of pump that these they usually are so they're designed to basically last you know for 10 15 years of, of almost constant operation not particularly high performance but it's, it's a very good way of uh, transmitting the torque and then the other kind of pump we have is a wet rotor pump. Um, so in a wet rotor pump, this is a sort of generation two, the, the, the current state of the art. The motor is designed to run with the rotor expo exposed to the coolant. So basically you have coolant passing through the pump and the, the pump itself is uh, has no dynamic seals. It's it's completely sealed unit. Um, but you do some clever stuff inside to keep the coolant away from the electronics and the, uh, the uh, important bits in the electric motor. So it, as, as the motor is, uh, is separate from the pump impeller in a magnetically coupled pump, a very efficient motor can be used, but the, the magnetic coupling still requires extra magnets. Uh, the, the, the magnets themselves, they, can, they still suffer from the problem. Uh, they tend to need to be very strong magnets to transmit the torque. Um, they attract particles. So again, central heating system, one of the big issues is um, ferrous particles clogging up your pump so it stops working so people fit big magnetic particle filters that that's an issue with these uh, mag drive pumps also the cost and the weight and the size of the mag coupling means it's not really that suitable for an automotive application uh, there's there's a couple of companies out there who do sell mag drive pumps for automotive uh, type applications but you won't really find them any massive high volume applications um, the, the much more common uh, type of pump now is a, is a sealless pump so this is a what you know where the rotor runs in the coolant, um, and this type of pump, the motor is designed so the state is sealed off from the coolant by a static sealing and uh, sleeving arrangement, and the rotor spins inside this sleeve, completely submerged in the coolant. Um, a small amount of coolant is encouraged to flow through the rotor cavity, and this acts as a lubricant uh, in the bearings. But normally, you'd use a material in the bearings that is capable of running dry without the coolant, so self a self lubricating material. So um, so they can tolerate run dry. And this kind of design, it, it gets rid of all of the reliability issues of the seal in a conventional sealed pump and the complexity of a mag coupling. But there's one big issue with it. it, it then uh, the t you have to run a big air gap in the motor uh, to get over the, the cavity uh, seal. Uh, and, and that means you basically have to sacrifice motor efficiency. Uh, so the, the, the efficiency of the motor is a function of the air gap. Um, and we have to run a very big air gap in these sealless pumps, uh, which can significantly reduce motor efficiency. So if you look at the sort of mass market sealless pumps um, that are out there at the moment, they're typically not very efficient. And that's that's why that's uh, the conversion of the electrical energy to the pumping power. You've got the losses in the impeller pump, but then you've got some quite significant losses in the motor because they're running a, a very big air gap with a, a pretty conventional motor. Um, you still do with a with a wet running pump. You still do have to be careful about ferrous particles. Uh, you don't want those getting jammed up inside there. So you need to make sure that you keep ferrous particles out of the system. But basically, in a in a in a well designed cooling system, a wet rotor pump should have a very very long service life. Uh, if it's not subject to too much dry running, you're basically talking about a pump that should last forty fifty thousand hours um, easily. Overall, uh, a sealed pump is not really the preferred choice for a low temperature application. So conventional sealed coolant pump, um, you, you can use them, but in a low temperature application, you have to be aware that you're going to have problems with uh, run dry and weepage past the seal. Uh, it's not really anything wrong with the with the pump, but just in the, in that kind of application. Um, you know, it's got very good base efficiency. Um, a magnetically coupled pump has the, has the same good base efficiency as a sealed pump. But the extra cost, the weight, and the, the packaging size of the mag coupling, they just, you know, they add a premium to the pump and they add size and weight and, and everyone wants to get away from that. That The wet rotor pump is really the, the one that everyone's homed in on. 
And and up until now, everyone's been prepared to make a sacrifice in terms of the overall efficiency because of the benefits of running um, with a sealless uh, design there. Um, now, what we've done at Avid, we've got a new uh, sealless pump, which we've just launched, and that's using some very clever motor and electronics technology. And what we've managed to do is make the same efficiency as a conventional sealed pump, but with a sealless uh, pump design. So it's it really represents quite a big step change in uh, an electric pump technology. Uh, so if you want to find out some more about that particular pump, get in touch with us. Um, I hope you found this podcast interesting um, in terms of talking about coolant pumps and the, the three different kinds of coolant pumps and the pluses and minuses in an EV and uh, other kinds of drivetrains. Um, if you've got any questions that you'd like answered, uh, do feel free to get in touch. We're really we're taking people's questions and we're using those um, to generate further podcast material. Um, we've got we've got two or three coming up, which we're where we're dedicating entire podcasts to answering specific questions that we've had in uh, from people who are listening. And that's it. I, I hope you've enjoyed today's podcast. Uh, please don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Uh, leave us a rating or, or hit like, depending on which platform you're listening to us on. Um, we'll be back to talk to you again soon.